Hello and welcome. I'm Josanne Leonard. The issue of constitutional design in Trinidad and Tobago is linked directly to its colonial past and the attainment of independence from its former colonial overlord, Great Britain. In an address to a public meeting about 14 months before he became Chief Minister in Port of Spain, Trinidad on 19th July 1955, Dr. Eric Williams had this to say, quote, the colonial office does not need to examine its second-hand colonial constitutions. It has a constitution at hand which it can apply immediately to Trinidad and Tobago. That is, the British constitution. Ladies and gentlemen, I suggest to you that the time has come when the British constitution, suitably modified, can be applied to Trinidad and Tobago. After all, if the British constitution is good enough for Great Britain, it should be good enough for Trinidad and Tobago. Well, we asked Dr. Hamid Ghani, who is the senior lecturer in political science and coordinator of the Constitutional Affairs and Parliamentary Studies Unit, Faculty of Social Sciences at UWI, to throw some light on this constitutional matter regarding the presidency of our republic. Dr. Ghani, when he said, quote, good enough for Great Britain, it should be good enough for Trinidad and Tobago. What did the first Prime Minister really mean? Well, I think what Dr. Williams was trying to get at is that he wanted a Westminster-style constitution for Trinidad and Tobago. Trinidad and Tobago had had an evolution um, after being captured by the British in uh, 1801. Um, from the, the Spanish formally being ceded. And as a consequence of that, one of the things that the colony of Trinidad and the subsequent colony of Tobago that was added to it um, after 1887 is that the two colonies became independent by 1962. Williams in 1955 was a private citizen and he was making an advocacy for a British style constitution, which would have been the Westminster model. And he kept that uh, throughout the time after he captured power and then he followed it. Uh, during the time that he and the PNM were in power. Did the exit of the Governor General and introduction of a President create any constitutional problems for Trinidad and Tobago? Well, when the Governor General uh, was replaced by the President, uh, we were no longer relying on Queen Elizabeth II being Queen of Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, we were now going to elect our own President, and as a consequence of that, uh, we had to have an electoral college that would be a joint sitting of both houses to elect a President. A number of situations have arisen um, that perhaps may not have arisen before because of the issue of impeachment. Um, as one of the things that would happen to a president to remove a president from office. And when there's a dissolution of parliament, because parliament is the place where an impeachment process would start, um, you obviously could not have an impeachment process commence. In the uh, 2000 into 2001 period, there was some difficulties for the then government when President Robinson refused the advice of Prime Minister Pandey to appoint seven senators who were defeated as candidates at the polls to have them as senators and a constitutional crisis of sorts emerged. The government could do nothing uh, with regard to that because parliament was dissolved. And when the new parliament uh, assembled on the 12th of January 2001, um, the crisis was still going on, uh, but it was eventually resolved uh, subsequently between Prime Minister Pandey and President Robinson. But what it did expose is that during a dissolution, the Electoral College cannot be convened because it is the President who must reconvene them. And if he's to be impeached, he's not going to do it. Well, we remember in 2002, the issue of the acting President arose when then President a &R Robinson was ill. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the constitutional technicalities that applied in that situation. Well, what happened after the uh, December 10th, 2001 general election, there was an 1818 tie. And uh, there was a long period of time before Parliament was convened uh, to be able to have the election of a Speaker, uh, etc., and for the seventh Parliament to begin. Um, that Parliament was unable to elect a Speaker. And uh, two attempts were made, 5th and 6th of April 2002, 28th of August 2002, and uh, then a dissolution was announced on the 28th of August 2002. The election was held uh, on the 7th of October 2002. Parliament was convened on 17th October 2002. The interesting situation was that President Robinson was ill. 
and Dr. Linda Babulal, who was president of the Senate, was acting as president on a number of occasions in that uh, intervening period. Uh, the proclamation for a new parliament to assemble was signed on the 11th of October 2002 by President Robinson. So he would have been well enough on that day to sign that proclamation as a substantive president. But by the 17th of October, um, his, his health was somewhat questionable and, pres and uh, Dr. Linda Babulal had been acting as president in the interim. On that day, President Robinson had to be well enough uh, for state duty because Parliament was opening. Now, when the clerks of the Parliament read the proclamation from the President, that effectively terminates the term of office of the two presiding officers, the Speaker and the President of the Senate. At that point, Dr. Babalal ceased to be President of the Senate upon the reading of the proclamation. And she was re-elected as President of the Senate and the record will simply show that there was an adjournment for her to be robed and she came back and everybody else was sworn in. And uh, what the record will not show is that um, after having been sworn and the sitting being suspended, she went off to President's house where she was obviously met by a member of the judiciary who swore her into office as acting president. She then rode in state back to the parliament where she entered the chamber for a joint sitting to deliver the presidential address as acting president of the republic. And um, in that situation, uh, we had the very curious scenario of someone who just lost office as president of the Senate, just regained it as president of the Senate, went back up to president's house, was sworn back in as acting president. President Robinson would have been deemed to be no longer fit to carry out state duty at that stage. And then she would have gone back to the parliament. So it was a very, very curious situation. But it, again, it revealed um, a difficult um, situation in our presidential past. Well, that, that's, quite a, that's quite a narrative um, for students of constitutional reform and for understanding how, you know, things work or possibly do not work. But, you know, staying on the topic, we also had a situation regarding the acting president in March of 1998, when the then president of the Senate, Ganesh Ramdial, acted as president during the visit of His Royal Highness uh, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. Yes, and that was another curious situation. And this has to do with the ability of the president to determine when he is unable to carry out the functions of his office and, uh, and when he can. So in that particular situation, in March of 1998, um, Senator Ganesh Ramdial, who was president of the Senate, uh, was acting as president because President A. N. R. Robinson was ill and unable to carry out the functions of his office. And what had happened on that occasion is that Pre President Robinson attended the ceremony where 122 medals were being given out to persons who had earned uh, awards under what was previously the Duke of Edinburgh award scheme and had now become the president's scheme. And the Duke of Edinburgh had actually come to Trinidad for the occasion. But what happened is that the acting president who was carrying out the functions of the office, Senator Ganesh Ramdial, was there. And so too was President Robinson. But he was not well enough to carry out his functions, but he was well enough to attend a social event. So there they were, the acting president, officially receiving the Duke of Edinburgh and having alongside him President Robinson, the substantive president who was unable to carry out the functions of his office but was well enough to attend the social event and was introduced. So that we have the two of them present on the occasion, the acting president and the substantive president, one who was carrying out the functions of the office and the other who was not well enough to carry out the functions of the office. And the other thing was the issue of President Ellis Clark in April of 1986 um, who left the country for three days to go abroad, made no arrangements for an acting president. There was no acting president, and when he came back, there was some discussion about it, and he spoke about it in the media. Uh, the Guardian for the 13th of April uh, 1986 has a story under the caption, President Clears the Air, uh, in which he said that it was he who would determine whether or not he was unable to carry out the functions of his office by virtue of his absence. He was gone for three days, and he determined that there was no need to make any acting arrangement for an acting president, and therefore there was none. So that um, we've had that situation, but what Ellis Clark was saying is that the president is the sole determiner of whether or not the president can carry out 
uh, his or her functions as the case may be and therefore you have that particular situation because it would invoke in a parliamentary sense the president of the senate becoming acting president which then creates another scenario within the parliament but none was created because the country had no president for three days because the president deemed that he uh, was not in any way unable to perform the functions of his office. Well, a lot of a lot of information in there, and and certainly a lot of references to things that we would have to ponder in more serious terms. But I'm sure right for the people who write great scripts uh, for television, as we see. But tell us about 2002, when we failed to elect a speaker on two occasions. There was a general election on the 10th of December 2001, which resulted in an 1818 tie. On Christmas Eve 2001, President Robinson determined that he would revoke the appointment of Prime Minister Pandey and appoint the leader of the opposition, Patrick Manning, as Prime Minister, and that he would appoint Basdeo Pandey as leader of the opposition. Basdeo Pandey refused to accept the um, appointment of the president. Uh, there was a long delay between the general election and the uh, opening of parliament, and the parliament was convened on April 5th, 2002, after a general election on the 10th of December 2001. When the parliament met, the clerk was handling proceedings, and uh, several attempts were made over two days, 5th and 6th of April 2002, to elect a speaker, which ended in uh, the last determination on this Sunday after, on this, this Saturday afternoon, the 6th of April, that there would be um, to, to come again on Monday to try, but that never happened because uh, Prime Minister Manning advised President Robinson to prorogue Parliament, which effectively ended the first session of the seventh Parliament. Uh, so Parliament went into a recess and they came out on the 28th of August, the clerk the clerks in both houses read a proclamation declaring that the second session was going to begin and the second session commenced in the House of Representatives with the government again trying to nominate a speaker. Um, uh, a nomination was put forward, Mr. Hector McLean, uh, the House did not agree to it and then Prime Minister Manning announced at that stage that he would advise His Excellency the President to dissolve Parliament at midnight on the 28th of August. Uh, the effect of that was that there was no speaker for the entire seventh parliament and the country was in a situation where if anything had happened um, to the president, the president of the Senate would act and President Robinson was ill on several occasions during that period. But beyond the president of the Senate, there was only the vice president of the Senate because the speaker would have been unable to, to be there because there was none. So in situations where neither the president of the Senate nor the speaker of the house are available, the vice president of the Senate shall act for seven days, during which time the deputy speaker has 48 hours to convene the electoral college to elect someone to be president. So in effect, the state had a seven day holder on standby, the vice president of the Senate, but there could have been no electoral college to be convened to elect a president. So we were skating on very thin constitutional ice during that entire period until the 8th Parliament convened on the 17th of October 2002 and you then got a president and a vice president. So it was a very, very tricky period of time. Well, it is these situations as have been outlined uh, by Dr. Hamid Ghani, which have really brought all of us, Trinidad and Tobago, and the functioning of our democracy very close, as you have said, to perilous consequences that really should make us consider some reforms in the way in which our presidency is expected to function. Some have argued that the time has come to consider an executive presidency in which the president is directly elected by the population and his or her powers are accordingly adjusted to permit the checks and balances that will accompany the separation of powers principle. I'm sure you have a lot more to say on that, Dr. Ghani, in subsequent programs. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.